starting my recording. All right, um, welcome to the ninth webinar in the IGNIS series, and we're wrapping up the year with our faculty learning community presentations. And um, as a reminder, IGNIS is the Latin word for spark or ignite, and that's what we're hoping to do here today is to ignite your curiosity about our Washington FLCs and to have them share their awesome knowledge with us. My name is Alyssa Sells, and I'm the SBCTC eLearning Program Administrator, and my counterpart is Jennifer, Jennifer Wetham, and she is the SBCTC Program Administrator for Faculty Development. And uh, this series is brought to you by SBCTC eLearning and ATL, of which Jen and I are both active um, participants in those. So um, you might have heard of us uh, referred to as the dynamic duo or the wonder twins because we're kind of two sides of the same professional development coin. Jennifer hits more on um, pedagogy and instructional topics while I um, assist with uh, e-learning topics. And I'm not sure if Amber is going to be joining us today. It doesn't look like um, I see her, so I will not introduce her today. And we're very excited to offer this webinar series to everyone, and we have a great lineup of presenters for you today, and Jennifer will be introducing them shortly. And I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank our presenters for sharing their experience and knowledge, and to all of the participants who are logging in now to attend the ses session live, and for those of you who may be watching the session later um, in a recording. I am going to put into the chat right now uh, a URL for the ATL blog, and you can go here and check out the IGNIS schedule, and you can also find recordings from past webinars if you missed out on some of them. All right, so um, I think that we are ready to get started, so we're just going to hop and skip through a couple of the Collaborate tools. We're going to move a little faster today since we don't have a super large group with us. So um, if you haven't already, go ahead and test your audio if you're planning on using your mic today. And let me get our slides going here. All right, so here's our meeting interface. We will be using the whiteboard and the whiteboard tools in just a minute. If you're curious who's in the webinar with us, you can look into that participants panel and scroll through and see all the names of everyone in attendance. If you have a question or a comment, uh, feel free to put that into the chat. And um, you'll see in the upper um, audio video pane, um, you can see either the, the live webcam or a picture usually of whomever is speaking at the moment. All right, so here are some additional tools that um, participants have access to. We have emoticons, and I will go ahead and give a smiley face so you can see what that looks like there. I'm easy to do demos for. It looks like Jennifer did, too, because my name, Alyssa, is always at the top of the list. Uh, if you need to step away, go ahead and click the step away button. That lets us know that you're not here. Uh, raise your hand if you'd like to make a comment or ask a question, and we will call on you in numerical order. That kind of helps get us organized. Right next to that is the polling tool, and we're going to be using that here in just one sec. I am going to change that to, um, and I always forget to do this before <laughs> we start the session, I'm going to change this to um, an alphabetical answer. So um, now instead of a check mark, you see an A there. You'll know that you're speaking when your blue microphone is um, showing next to your name, and that shows that your talk button is on. When you're finished speaking, uh, please turn off the talk button because we can hear everything in the background, typing, dogs barking, all that kind of fun stuff. All right, uh, here's a close-up of our chat window. Again, go ahead and type in questions as we go. Uh, we'll revisit those toward the end of the session in our question and answer portion. Our um, presenters are operating on an Ignite format, a uh, loose Ignite format, where we'll give them, um, I think, probably about 10 minutes today for each of them to present, and we don't interrupt them while they're presenting. And then we'll go back to the chat and revisit your questions. All right, so here's our whiteboard tools, and if you can find on your actual whiteboard tools, it's that skinny little bar kind of toward the middle of your screen, you can hover over and click on the sun icon for me and select a pointer tool. I'm going to grab the smiley face. You can practice here if you need to. And then on the next slide, we're actually going to use this. All right, so um, go ahead and grab your pointer again and find where on the map you are. I'm in Snohomish County in Everett, so I'm going to put my little smiley there. And we kind of do this, Jen and I do this um, as a fun thing, just a fun way to see who's joining us and where you're all at. Okay, looks like we've got a few marks on the map here. All right, and since we're going a little faster today, I'm going to go ahead and move on. 
All right. And um, here's another little poll that we do because we're curious. Uh, we want to know if you're full-time or part-time faculty, if you're an administrator or staff, or um, if you qualify as other. Maybe you're a community partner that's joining us today. Um, go ahead and check that off for us. I'll be C, an administrator. And what I'll do is go ahead and publish that to our uh, windows so you can all see that. Oops. Sorry. Clicked the wrong one. There we go. Okay. So most of us today are administrators. So I'm in good company. Well, I'm always in good company with you guys. All right. Um, next slide is our meeting etiquette. And um, just want to remind you to raise your hand when you'd like to speak. Click on your talk button when you're talking. Turn it off when you're not speaking. Use your emoticons to indicate approval or a job well done. And make sure that you type those questions into the chat or thoughts or comments as we go so that we can come back to them. All right, and I'm going to turn it over to Jen now, who is going to introduce our topics for today. Take it away, Jen. Thanks, Alyssa. And as usual, you did a great job. <laughs> you always, it's always so fun. So. That was the fast version. <laughs> you, did, you did well. You did very well. Almost five minutes. So um, I always like to just talk a little bit about what the faculty learning community is. And ours are loosely based on the Miami model. So a group of faculty, um, sometimes students, and professional staff come together to collaboratively design a year-long program for their own professional learning. And this could range from retreats to seminars to informal meetings. Um, but it's a great way for faculty to design their own professional learning, which I really like. So this is just talking a little bit about what the kind of work that can happen in an FLC. And as if you've been attending these webinars or watching these webinars, you, you can see that uh, there's a range of activities and types of work that um, happen. So faculty. Um, if you participate in an FLC, it's shown to increase faculty interest in teaching and learning. And I think the, one of the big benefits is it really provides safety and support for faculty to take risks, to investigate, to attempt something, to try out a new technique or a new model. So I, I, some, sometimes teaching can feel at least for me, it, sometimes taking a risk felt a little dangerous. And so sometimes it's nice if you have other people that you're engaging in that work with. We, today we're going to look at um, a cohort-based FLC, um, adjunct faculty from Bellevue College who got together to talk about what teaching online might look like in that, spe in that specific discipline. Um, they've, I've seen this presentation before. They do a great job. And it's really neat when people who might be isolated come to use an FLC to come together. And then we also have topic-based FLCs. And we're also going to see um, a really great example of a topic-based FLC as we um, explore with South Puget Sound operating systems uh, so that people could collaboratively design open texts. So very exciting today. And for the uh, for the third web or the third FLC we're going to look at today, the courage to teach. I think that it's sort of a cohort and a topic based FLC, but maybe Sally will tell us what, what side she claims or if she claims both. Um, so that's the, uh, I have other slides that we'll show you at the end. So um, now we are going to go to our first presentation. And I'm going to go back to the public page. And Rick McKinnon is going to talk to us about the work that his FLC did on OER platforms. And I'm going to turn off my mic. Uh, 
There we go. It's talking without my mic on. So you should see my first slide. And I'm going to be talking today about uh, faculty and OER. And I called this um, talk Moving from Target to Agent. And first, I want to acknowledge the other members of the team here that participated in this faculty learning community. Uh, Dave Noblock, Jennifer Wartman, Karen Halpern, John Schaub, Sarah Cabbage, and Kelly Glasso, and Haley Torrey. And uh, this, these slides are all available on Prezi as well. You can search for me, or you can use this uh, URL to find this presentation. So the goal is to talk about faculty empowerment. And this really rises from the sense that faculty are, um, in many ways, the target right now of a lot of energy around open educational resources. And it feels like they are having things uh, really thrown at them. Um, and uh, it's a little bit overwhelming. And uh, so I want to talk about is how to transform that into a more um, agent-oriented role, where they play um, a more active uh, role in developing OER in a widespread kind of way, so that it's not uh, limited to a small cohort of creators. And I'll just go briefly through the logic of OER. So we're here because um, there's great evidence that OER save a bundle of money for students. And um, that's because cost book uh, the the, te the cost of textbooks has just risen astronomically, so that students spend as much as twelve hundred per year um, for uh, textbooks, um, rivaling uh, the cost of tuition almost, and uh, in increasing the amount of debt that they uh, incur. And this has to do with certain market distortions, um, like the fact that faculty are assigning someone else to buy something that they themselves are not paying for. And so it doesn't have the same sort of market um, forces that we would expect when people have to spend their own money. One of the, um, one of the uh, projects um, that uh, was created to address this issue was the Open Course Library to take the 81, this is just an example, the 81 um, highest enrolled courses in the Washington State system, put a cap on textbook costs, um, have all the content be openly licensed, and have faculty authors. Um, and this has, um, um, even without the widespread uptake, it seems that it's um, covered its costs, so it's been a good return on investment. Um, but in spite of that, I'd say that um, it's not exactly um, been transformational. So it hasn't really turned into um, something that we would think of as broad uptake um, and uh, fulfilled some of the expectations that were built up around it. And I think that are possible. Um, but if we could get these uh, stars all to align, I think it really could transform the work of faculty. Um, in, a, in a pretty amazing way, um, not just about the economics of it, but really about the what, what are the sort of work, working conditions of faculty? How do they practice their craft? Um, the Open Course Library is one example of several that have um, had the following characteristics. Um, Short-term funding models, usually from government. A focus on licensing structure for content. Um, and not so much on the creation side. Um, tight control of the content. Um, and treating faculty really as sole agents, uh, individuals in, in the, um, the whole uh, picture, um, as opposed to um, developing ways for them to group and collaborate. And I'd, I'd argue that, that um, not just the Open Course Library, but several other projects like this have turned out to be largely unsustainable. Um, the, the jury's still out on the open course library itself. And thing, you know, there's a lot of energy being put into marketing and, and pushing that, that information out. Um, we'll see what happens with that. But that, I think what we've experienced is not inconsistent with uh, what's happened with other large repositories like this. 
and the others, the trend has been to um, build something that's big, like a course or a textbook, um, and that makes sense. Um, if uh, you want to save, save students money, then um, sort of addressing the textbook issue really cuts to that particular cost. Um, and um, so it makes sense that that would be sort of the focus. And it sort of fits into the traditional way that we deliver our content um, in higher education. Um, it, it sort of fits into a slot that faculty know well. Um, so uh, looking at these projects and their sustainability, we ask the question, how does this, um, how does this work going forward? Well, the suggestion has been um, reciprocal agreements between states, for example. So California builds um, you know, the math uh, library. Uh, Arizona builds the, uh, the um, uh, social science. Uh, Washington works on English, or however you want to parse it out. And they just share. Um, so we're sort of in the middle of this right now, in, in I would say even the early stages, and we'll have to see how it looks. But I think there's a, a missed opportunity here, and it has to do with um, overlooking some of what um, the process is that goes into creating textbooks and really what the process is of teaching. So um, if it were solely about uh, an open data project, the, the steps would be clear. We'd have an idea say, for example, promoting financial disclosure. We create a structure, we get our content in order, and we just try to drive uptake as much as possible. Uh, but I think that that does, doesn't characterize what happens in higher education. Um, so uh, I think we've really got two different levels that we need to address here. One is clearly the, um, the, the macro level of the legal framework and the other is the micro level of the actual pedagogy. And I think we've really only looked at one so far, and it makes sense to start to look at the other more carefully. So what I would say is that Creative Commons is a legal framework. It's kind of like what happened with the purchase of the, the, the Louisiana Purchase, opening up a whole swath of new territory to be explored. Um, and uh, But it's not really about single uh, um, farmers out there working the land and, and doing the hard work that it takes to, to create um, value in it. And so in this analogy, of course, um, Cable Green is equal to uh, Thomas Jefferson. But looking at that macro level um, doesn't get you all the way down to the actual creation of content um, in a way that, that I think is sustainable. So um, there's a few slides here about technology acceptance. I'm going to skip over them in the, in the, uh, for the sake of time. Um, we can talk about it at, afterwards if people are interested. But essentially, um, uh, a textbook is too big for um, a single um, faculty member to um, take on. And so this leads us to um, a more communal kind of, uh, of approach. Um, so there's my, my too big to tackle slide. Um, and it's really thinking of open educational resources as a digital barn raising um, and, and sort of recasting the whole issue of OER not as content licensing but as uh, faculty development and um, working within communities or building communities of practice around textbooks so that they um, can um, operate in a sustainable way. Uh, so um, communities of practice are um, groups of people that are forged around a certain meaningful activity that can be different levels, um, but I think it characterizes pretty well um, the community of folks, for example, in our state who care about teaching um, English 101 or math and society or uh, introduction to sociology or a lot of other courses. So our task in our uh, faculty learning community was to um, explore um, not so much the, the, the mechanics of the um, 
uh, communities of practice, but to think about um, what are the particular tools that um, might be used to support that kind of community. Um, one of the initial discussions that happened among our faculty was um, how uh, does this work if you use a lot of different kinds of materials in your course? What if it doesn't fit naturally into a textbook kind of a mold? Um, and so that's a conversation that um, you can have. I think that um, a lot of people would argue that a um, uh, uh, sort of a geology course, um, this is one of the paradigms that we sort of thought about um, because of one of our instructors, um, fit well within the textbook kind of a model. But um, Math and Society used probably a lot of different kinds of content and, and would be great as a course, and as, as a sort of an open course, but maybe not so much in the textbook mold. Maybe that's important, maybe that's not important, um, as, as long as it's able to replace a textbook. So um, I've got some documents. They're not showing up well here on my uh, display, so they're probably not showing up well for you. But the basic idea was uh, figuring out who's in the network, who's in your network that you could access as an instructor to help you divide up this uh, task of creating a textbook. It's really the first question that you need to ask yourself um, as, a, as a faculty member. Um, who can I uh, sort of divvy this up with that can take chapters um, and, and divide up this huge task um, and create that community. So it's who's in your network. And there's a couple of forms here. You can go back and look at them, and uh, they're, they're fairly simple. The other question um, next was, how do you organize these people? What kind of uh, um, tools do you use? We evaluated a bunch of them, um, just talking about their suitability, and um, these included tools for sharing and organizing, like Wikispaces, Huddle, Google Docs, Dropbox. Um, also tools for editing, like um, blog type platforms, like Ning or WordPress or Drupal. Tools for rendering or distributing content, um, and those were like soft chalk. Um, there's a couple of intriguing um, platforms that have been developed. One is called Nota, which is more developed for collaborative textbook creation with students. Um, but I've, I've talked to their developers, and they're interested also in getting faculty to work together to create textbooks as well. But it allows for a lot of um, content to be nominated by um, users um, and linked um, to the book. And then another one called Vellum, which um, looks like it's a nice way to um, create um, books, although it doesn't incorporate um, images, which disqualified it for our purposes. And then um, what we found, basically, is that we could do everything we wanted to do with Google Drive and with, um, excuse me, uh, Um, we could do everything we wanted to do with Google Drive and with uh, um, Canvas. I can't move my phone. There we go. Oh, stop. Okay. So Google Drive and Canvas together worked perfectly well for doing everything we needed to do. Um, because basically you can um, just uh, put HTML, so this is a uh, a Google Doc um, on the top and the same document embedded in Canvas on the bottom. Um, and even if you're not embedding the content, uh, just the document directly, you can uh, embed the HTML code and you can also put in any kind of widget or demonstration just in HTML actually in Canvas um, as well. So you have a huge amount of flexibility in Canvas to be able to, to add any, any content um, that you'd like. So our conclusions were that um, faculty um, can be the master of their own destiny um, by building communities of practice around their specific content areas. Um, textbooks uh, become basically a knowledge base that people can participate in at various levels. Um, 
this is an associative commons um, rather than a libertarian commons, which you might think of as something more like Wikipedia. And there are lots of interesting tools that are emerging in this space. Um, we found Google, Talk, Google Docs and Canvas to be the best solutions for uh, working in. They're cloud-based, they're very flexible, and um, uh, they can do everything that, that we wanted them to do. So thinking forward about this, um, it's really about networking and um, bringing faculty together in ways that allow them to um, establish um, these kinds of communities. So one of the thoughts that we had was, why don't we have OER conferences where you know, English faculty get together for an intensive period of time, you know, a weekend, and um, work on building an OER textbook. Um, this could happen cyclically, um, quarterly, yearly, who knows, um, along with lots of offline work. Um, and that would be a more sustainable model for um, working, um, for building open educational resources than um, the traditional way of sort of the, the ways that we've tried it so far, which is pay faculty for it up front and then license it. Um, of course, everything would still be licensed open um, Creative Commons, just sustained through the continued participation of a community of practice. OK, that's what I got. That was great, Rick. Um, like, that was so much information, so much high quality, really good information. And um, I, I'm especially pleased that you're sort of um, addressing this issue of repositories, because I think that, that sometimes that's the first sort of like, oh, let's make a repository. And, you know, it just, you're right, that's such a focus on products. And this communities of practice. Exactly metaphor is awesome. Um, so anyway, so we'll, we're, we'll keep moving. Um, so Kathy and Sue asked if they could go next as Sue has to leave. Of course, that's totally fine. So um, we'll, we'll, ta we'll, we'll table questions until the end, so we'll, but we'll have some time to talk. So um, OK, I'm going to go to the slides here. Um, all right, so take it away. Okay, so this is the Sue half of Kathy and Sue. And we tend to think of teaching as a social activity. There's usually students in front of us, and we interact with them, we interact with other teachers on a regular basis. But teaching online is different, and it's actually pretty isolating. Um, we tend to do it alone at home or alone in our office. And when we do communicate with students, it's usually uh, over the computer, so not face-to-face. -face. And so we really wanted to work on overcoming isolation and online teaching. That was our key idea. Because at Bellevue College, in the Social Science Division, 31% of our classes are fully online. And 44% of instructors teach online for at least part of their class load. And so we have pretty significant proportions. But also, many of these instructors are part-time and often aren't on campus. Now, there are definitely upsides to teaching online and, and being alone and that you can do it in your pajamas, you can do it on your own schedule, you can do it while snacking. Um, but there are also downsides, both for the instructor and the students when online instructors get isolated. One downside is you can get stuck in a rut. So if you have the same course and you're teaching it over and over again, it's easy just to copy it and teach it the same way you always have. Um, because you're not getting inspired with new ideas by talking to other instructors or even really the interaction with students. Another downside is you decide, OK, yes, I'm going to implement changes. But you may end up reinventing the wheel, because you might put lots of work into an idea that a colleague already perfected. You just don't know it because you haven't been talking to them. Finally, if you're isolated as an online teacher, you may lack knowledge of some of the new and improved features available in Canvas. We did an informal survey of online teachers and found out that most in our division did not read the Canvas updates. So the goal of our FLC, the Social Science Learning Online Group, or SLOG, was to improve online teaching and learning in our division. And so an important part of this was to give instructors a place to talk to each other face to face so we could work on reducing that isolation of teaching online. Now, obviously, an FLC can't overcome all the barriers um, of isolation. Some of our instructors live really far away, or they're just too busy to come to campus and attend meetings. But we wanted to offer an opportunity for people who were able to do so and who wanted to do so. So we did some nudging. The first thing we did 
we sent out an email to encourage people to attend. And we emailed the whole social science division to ask who'd be interested in attending. And we also gave some tentative topics so they'd have an idea of what we'd be wanting to do. And then we scheduled meetings around their availability, the people who were interested. We used Doodle, and of course we used the Outlook calendar. And then finally we bribed people with food and coffee, which we could do because we had the grant. So now I'm handing it over to Kathy. Hi, we're sharing a headset. So this is Kathy. Um, so one of the most popular um, events that we scheduled was what we called Speed Canvassing, which is a collaborative activity which helps online instructors overcome isolation um, and improve their teaching. If the name reminds you of speed dating, that is intentional. Um, like speed dating, uh, people will get into pairs and talk to each other for a certain length of time before changing and talking to a different partner. Uh, one important difference was with speed canvassing, um, the people in the pairs had two laptops open in front of them with their Canvas sites open, and they were talking and asking questions about each other's sites. So faculty who participated in these sessions gave us feedback, and it was very positive. Um, they all found these sessions very useful. And in fact, I was the person in charge of keeping time, and it was actually really difficult to get people to switch after the 10 minutes because they got so involved in their conversations with their colleagues. So what kinds of things did people learn when they participated? Well, some of the learning was just learning about features of Canvas that they didn't know. For example, you know, oh, I see you have little green check marks next to the parts of your module. How did you get that? Uh, that was the kind of question which somebody could answer. Um, and there was also um, discussion about uh, setting up the home page and setting up modules. And there is, as a result of these meetings, some of us in the social science division have been trying to come up with a sort of similar format for our classes so that when uh, students take more than one class in social science division, they don't have a big learning curve to figure out how did this instructor organize their class. There's going to be some similarity. So these speed canvassing sessions were really easy to set up. All you need. Um, uh, some laptops connected to the web and somebody to keep track of time. We had about eight participants at each session and that was quite a good number. It was small enough that it wasn't intimidating and everybody could talk, pretty much talk to everybody else. Um, and because we had food, it felt more like a social occasion, not like a formal training. So it was an enjoyable thing to participate in. Other benefits for faculty uh, that they in addition to just learning facts about Canvas, they now feel as though they're part of a community of practice of online instructors. And they have people to talk to when they have questions about using Canvas or about teaching online in general. And they know, oh, if I have a question about this, I know who to go to because they have done it before. So um, there are obviously benefits to teachers, but there are benefits to students also. When teachers are happy, students are happy. And students appreciate it when they see that instructors are competent with the technology and when they're excited about their teaching and trying out new ideas. So to conclude, speed canvassing is a pretty simple idea. It's very easy to set up, and it doesn't take very much time for instructors to participate. But it has some big payoffs. By reducing the isolation of online instructors, it improves teaching and learning in online courses and thereby contributes to student success, which is, of course, our ultimate goal. Okay, that's our, our Ignite session. Wonderful. Kathy and Sue, thank you so much. Um, I, I, again, I, I just typed this into the chat window, but I think it's such a great example of a cohort-based FLC, um, you know, where people are doubly isolated because of teaching online and being, um, and being adjunct faculty. And so I just think it's, it's so great that you guys use this um, this structure in ways that really served you and your students. So thank you for a lovely job. Thanks a lot. Um, applause. <laughs> so finally, uh, we have Sally Heilstad from Lake Washington. And she is going to tell us about, um, uh-oh, sorry, I just want to make sure I have the right slides here. Uh, Sally's going to tell us about their FLC on um, the courage to teach. And it looks like the slides got a little bit 
uh, mixed up, but I think I've got them in the right order now. Um, Sally, whenever you're ready, take it away. Great. Thanks, Jennifer. And that looks correct. Um, so I am ready to get started. I hope you all are having a good afternoon. So our FLC was focused on reading Parker Palmer's book, The Courage to Teach, and using that as a way um, to really start exploring ourselves as teachers and how to be authentic to who we were and to improve our teaching kind of by looking at our core values and our strengths and um, our passion for our subjects and how we can engage students um, in that way. The first thing we did as a group was that we established shared expectations and norms. And for our group, those really came down to four kind of core values, trust, respect, grace, and humility. And it was interesting. Um, I gave kind of an overview of Palmer's work. I hadn't read it myself. Um, but kind of, you know, having read some things online in the back of the book, um, I gave an understanding of what it was in order to attract people to the group. And when our group worked together, we did this at the first meeting to establish these norms. It was incredible to see um, that the group really truly had attracted people to it that were um, already asking the types of questions that Palmer addresses. And it came out in these shared values. Um, I just wanted to touch a little bit on grace. We talked about offering that to others and to ourselves in the process of understanding self. It's really easy to be critical. Um, and so we focused a lot on that. And then humility, that there's really kind of this pressure as an instructor to know everything and that it's OK um, to acknowledge that you really don't um, and that you're learning as well. And so that was really nice. All right, so I'm going to jump into kind of some of the highlights of the work that we did and how we talked about teaching um, from this perspective of being authentic to self and connecting um, with the subject and creating a community of learning in the classroom. So the first thing we talked about was high impact teachers. So it was just simply asking the question, um, who was someone at some point in your own education who had an impact on you um, as an educator? And I shared, um, and I'll share here, one of the teachers that had the greatest impact on me was one of my graduate school instructors. His name is Dr. Inslee. And he invited me to go back um, and talk to a new cohort of students about time management um, as a graduate student who was also employed full time. And what I didn't know, but I, maybe in the back of my gut felt, was that he asked the question um, in a program that was um, community development, so very social justice oriented, and tied in with counseling. How do you, in your time management, build in um, time to manage your emotions and your emotional response to the material? And I had actually had a very difficult time with that and quit the program for a year because I didn't know how to manage that. And he asked me the question on purpose. And I, of course, got very emotional sharing with the students and was incredibly embarrassed and felt like I had kind of failed as a teacher in this setting. And as I was walking out, he said this to me, the best place from which to teach is one of honesty. And I felt like, wow, that's really why he had such an impact on me even before that moment, because that was something he had done. And so I shared that as an example with the group. Um, so here are some photographs of participants in the group. The center two at the bottom are actually Dr. Inslee, my best friend, who was my other example of a great teacher. And then everybody else was members of the FLC. Um, and so Parker Palmer's idea around this is that good teaching cannot be reduced to technique. Good teaching comes from the identity and integrity of the teacher. And what's interesting is I also heard this at another session, and it became part of the FLC's understanding. And that's that we were building um, best persons in ourselves and not necessarily best practices. So again, coming back to the understanding of the people that we connected with ourselves as instructors who had a high impact on us were those who were being authentic to who they were, who were passionate about the subject that they taught, and that really cared about the students. Um, so you'll notice this is a list that was generated actually at the ATL pre-conference session. And you'll notice there really isn't a formula on the list. There's even things on here, and this is fantastic for later in the presentation, that are contradictory or paradoxical. Um, 
So they were able to share content, and be content driven, but also share life lessons. Um, they provide structure, but also freedom. Um, they don't, yeah, they don't have to be nice. So that's great. Um, that they really are challenging. Um, but also, again, there's that constant understanding that there's commitment to the subject and to the student. So another um, main idea from Palmer's work that really stood out to us as a group was the idea of paradox and within this idea of limits and potential. In certain circumstances, truth is found not by splitting the world into either ors, but by embracing it as both and. In certain circumstances, truth is a paradoxical joining of apparent opposites. And if we want to know that truth, we must learn to embrace those opposites as one. And so where this kind of comes up practically in the classroom, um, Palmer shares these insights for him um, that have an impact on his teaching. He creates a classroom space that's both open and bounded. So there's clear expectations, almost exactly to that list that was generated at ATL. There's that idea of um, there's freedom also to explore the topic and to bring self into it from the student perspective. And that is modeled by the instructor. Um, it's also hospitable and charged. So I love it comes from um, Cultures Connecting training, the idea that um, a classroom or, a, sorry, the topic that you're talking about inherently might not be comfortable and that it's okay to be uncomfortable when you're talking about the topic but that there's also this openness and respect and humility and grace that's experienced so that you can have both. Um, the voice of the individual and the voice of the group are both heard um, and brought together and understood. The stories of students and the stories of disciplines and tradition are important. And then solitude and the resources of community. And I've been struggling with this. Um, I am an extrovert to the max. Um, when I take my grades, I score the absolute highest. Um, I know that if I sit at my computer all day and don't do anything else, I'm exhausted. But if, if I have one conversation with a faculty member um, or a colleague, I'm just blown out of the water by it. So this is a paradox I struggle with um, in the classroom, is to recognize that there's value in both solitude and reflection, and then also in that community engagement and discussion. There's a great TED talk about introverts and what they have to offer that particular conversation. That's what I know. And then finally, being comfortable with silence and speech. And a lot of, um, we spent a lot of time talking about that in our FLC, that none of us um, in the group were really comfortable with letting silence happen. Um, one of the other ones I really wanted to touch on is the idea of success and failure. Um, often, going back to Palmer's idea of we've kind of split the world into pieces, we've taken failure and we've removed it from its absolutely essential role in success. And it was really exciting this quarter to hear a lot of faculty reflect on, you know, now that I feel confident in who I am as an instructor, I'm trying things in my classroom that I wouldn't have tried otherwise, and I'm open about the fact that I'm trying them, um, and that we're trying them together as a classroom community, and um, it's okay if it isn't great. So that's been really exciting. Um, they tweak things as they go, and there's a lot more um, excitement about teaching and trying new things, um, just as Sue. And Kathy shared, so that was great. All right, limits and potentials of self. So Parker then takes this idea and he says, one of the true paradoxes of teaching is that the same person who teaches brilliantly one day could be an utter flop the next. And he gets into the idea of all of us kind of, the way that I talk about it is um, all of our strengths have a shadow side. So I would share that one of my strengths is generosity. Um, and that can be incredibly helpful in offering support to students. But if I'm not careful with how I use that strength, it then becomes something that actually detracts from my energy and ability to connect with students. Um, one activity we did, and I'm excited we're going to be doing it as a college-wide activity this fall, is um, faculty share a moment in their teaching that they were really excited about and it went really well. And they then um, have the people in their small group identify their strengths as part of that. And it's a really enriching experience. It's really easy to do, and it creates that foundation again to work from to make changes. I just lost my screen. I'll be right back. Uh-oh. 
No, I'm back. Oh, okay. okay. Sorry, I'm totally over to you. I was like, I don't have enough to set. Okay, I'm going to breathe through this one. Subject-centered learning is um, exactly what um, Rick described when he was talking about building communities of practice around a textbook. Um, it's the idea that when um, you place the subject at the center, you're inviting your students and yourself into a dialogue with that subject, with one another, and with everyone else um, who's interacting with that subject through your course materials. And it's a really interesting shift in perspective. And I was thinking about that in terms of um, liberty and freedom in the classroom. So when the subject is the center of the class community, we're fr um, we free both ourselves and our students from the fear of having to know everything. And we're all free to explore the subject and continue learning more. So we spent quite a bit of time in our SLC talking about what that looks like. And this is Palmer's. Um, diagram. We did talk about in our community that maybe all those lines and positioning wouldn't necessarily be in a perfect little circle that you may have a knower who's kind of hanging out a little further away and one who's a little closer and how do you continue to engage that community. And I thought that was a really interesting insight from everyone. Um, we really did take this approach to our learning together in the SLC that we as teachers were at the center of the circle um, and that really together we were trying to understand what that meant in each of our lives and how we could support one another. Um, next year, we're planning to do another group, and we will be placing students at the center. And that's an exciting, totally other topic. The last um, thing that Paul really gets into at the end of his book is, OK, you've learned all this information. You're passionate about your subject and about teaching. You feel empowered to be who you are, and you feel like the system is working against you, potentially, in some situations, and it was really um, a tough chapter to read, and so we kind of came back to where do I end up feeling conflict? A lot of times that's around our core values. So we came back to an understanding of core values. Um, central to our identity and integrity as teachers are core values. They're what we stand for um, as individuals and teachers, and in other words, they are what matter to us, what we believe in, and who we want to be at our very best. And we did do an activity around that. And kind of coming back to this examination of self, of when do we kind of let ourselves get in the way of our core values in our teaching so that it loses that authentic connection with our students and our subject. And so that is all I have for today. I was just typing into the chat window. I'm really resonating with um, the behaviors. Too many personal examples or over filter myself. <laughs> I would always sort of fluctuate between those two. In fact, the, yeah, but I definitely a personal example. I was like, oh, be vulnerable and throw it in there. So, oh, wow. Um, yeah, we've had these, all three of these presentations are so great. So I guess what I'd like to do now is open it up for questions. Are there any questions for people, uh, for our presenters or comments? And you can go ahead and speak them or uh, type them into the chat window. And the presenters may question each other, too. <laughs> I see Laura is typing. Thanks, Laura. Uh, actually, I see a bunch of people are typing, so that is great. So we'll just um, we'll just wait and see what shows up in the chat window. Oh, oh, so Jerry is saying, I have a meeting at 3, so I have to run. Well, thanks. thank you, Jerry, for joining us. Um, we appreciate you uh, being such a faithful attender. Um, I'm thinking, uh, so Bellingham Tech says, the library directors have a grant request into the state library to fund a program for librarians and faculty to work together on OER classes. That is great. Um, 
And Laura says, all of these were very inspiring. I know. Me, I agree. I would like to see how to keep faculty engaged in an ongoing project such as the one suggested by Rick. How can you get faculty to participate? Um, Rick, do you, um, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, how did you keep the faculty engaged? Well, I think that's really the, um, the chief sort of challenge to doing this, this kind of work. And I think it really just has to grow from the genuine interest in, among faculty in, um, in building something of value and in, um, in just doing, doing things differently. And I, and I think it really, there are so, so many huge benefits to it when I, when I sort of think about it. I mean, the um, ability to work in a community can, um, I think, just be um, so cool. You know, it's just so much of what, what happens in teaching is in isolation. And, and, and this would be one way to really connect with a, a, a community of people doing the same thing that you're doing over a long period of time and really um, be so um, positive in terms of um, the benefits and, and, um, and professional development opportunities that you build yourself. I mean, it's just all, sort of all encapsulated in, in an OER. I mean, I think that that's why I think of OER and professional development really as being the same thing. So I would say money that you were going to devote to professional development activities, put it into um, building these communities of faculty to build OER. So, you know, and just basically putting the resources there. As you were as you were talking, I flipped to Sally's slide about the community of truth because I do think it there's a nice I think there's a nice connection between um, you know a community of practice around OER that puts the subject at the center. Um, so then you have all of these different knowers around you know and and everybody's sort of creating knowledge um, and nobody. Everyone's relieved of the pressure of sort of being the expert, which is a very different paradigm when you right. think about textbook authorship. <laughs> right, and it also connects with, to a comment that someone else made about including students. So you can have in a community of practice like this people who participate at different levels. So you can have people who you know are faculty, which are you know more of the big knower circle, and people who are you know slightly on the periphery, maybe that are are. Um, still knowers, but, you know, are not contributing as much or as frequently. Right, who still have valuable ideas. And what Laura exactly. said, um, I love the idea of incorporating student work. I have some of their work I add to my OER text. Their ideas and examples are so rich, which I completely agree. And they love when they're included. And th th talk about what a powerful perspective for authorship. Um, you know, if students could be authors of their own learning in a sense and they might be a little bit further out on the circle as Rick, as I, as I heard you just saying and Sally sort of posited that notion as well but they're still very valuable. Um, so it looks like there's some more stuff happening on the chat. Um, Sally says that's incredible. I would love to hear more about it. She's given you her email. <laughs> um, so and we will connect. And I think this gets us away from being married to the textbook. Our department labors over which textbook to choose. Why not create our own? Ab absolutely. I I do feel like. Um, the work that we've been, we've been, I've been really thinking a lot about how do I form a community of practice around people trying to shift our culture from one of deficit to one of capacity, you know, when we think about um, student learners. And it seems like there might be some really nice connections between giving students ownership and authorship, um, you know, through this sort of process, letting them be part of a community of practice that also lets them be experts as they're learning. Um, I think yeah, that's definitely true. And if you think about some of the conversation that's happening now about, you know, who gets to graduate and do I belong and how do you communicate belonging to people, I mean, mm -hmm. how better way to, to communicate that but then, but by including them in the actual process of, of creating the content that, that is the, the, the text for the course. Absolutely. Rick, um, I'm hoping that, um, you know, th th I'm seeing all these connections here. Um, you know, this this idea of building communities of practice around OER that are discipline rich. This to me just 
supports everything that I know about good professional learning, that it's project-based, but the process is just as important as the product, you know, to go back to that paradox, that, that tension that Sally brought up. Um, and to and to really move away from this idea that that a textbook or even that a repository is this static thing that like once you've done it you're you're done you know that it's a recursive process right I think it fits into a larger sort of um, way of thinking about the technology that we use and the internet um, instead of being for the biggest possible group of people that we can think of, you know, that's Wikipedia, or, you know, a huge repository. There are local applications to this technology that, that you know, allow a devoted group of people to really do some amazing stuff in a, in a local environment. Yes, um, and I'm I'm really hoping that you might help me plan some <laughs> professional development around this. Um, you know, because I I think at the state board we could we could definitely start to think about how we could collaborate with you. Too. Oh, we are conference baby. It's how to go. <laughs> I think I think Bo Young Che would be all over that. <laughs> I was going to say talk to Bo Young. Yeah. Yeah. Well, she she and I have been talking about how to how to provide um, professional development for faculty that would be engaging for them, and I feel like this this communities of practice idea is really a good one. Um, it's just a different it's just a different way to approach the same the work. Well, everyone, um, Sally and Laura, I hope that you guys will be in touch. And Laura, I hope um, we are we are planning um, a student voice community uh, community of practice. And so I hope you'll consider joining that and being part of it. And Rick, you too, because I know you guys are doing some really cool things with student voice, and it might you know it might help us under you know apply these tenets of um, the courage to teach, and also oh, this this idea of OER communities of practice that are really helping people know their discipline in different ways. So everyone, thank you. Um, this has been really, really fun. Um, and I, I can't think of a better play, a place I'd rather be than right here and right now. So thank you. Um, all right. And Alyssa put a survey um, link into the into the chat window. And actually, we do have, sorry, just a few more slides. I hope that you'll consider joining us next week for our final FLC highlights. Uh, Lower Columbia is going to talk to us about integrating cooperative learning activities into the classroom. Pierce is going to talk about interdisciplinary collaborations between professional technical programs. And Spokane Falls is going to speak about um, their FLC on universal design. So thank you, Rick and Sally and Sue and Kathy. You guys were great and uh, like great presentations today and very good work. Uh, yes, Sally, same time on the 10th. Same time, same bat channel. And, and it's our last one as before we close up shop until winter of 20, winter of 2015, if you can believe it. So all right, everyone. Oh, and Alyssa's posting the recording and schedule here. Alyssa, do you want to say anything? No. Nope. I'll let you um, take us out, and then I'll stop our recording. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.